Good evening. Thanks for having me here. So um, my uh, latest book, the title, The Moral Arc, was inspired, of course, by the words of the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on his uh, climax of his uh, march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, which we just celebrated the 50th anniversary uh, last weekend on March 7th, the start of it, actually. It took him not two weeks to get there, but it wasn't until President Johnson sent the armed troops in to make sure that they would get there uh, that that particular moral revolution happened, which he observed when he finally got there that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And in fact, five months later, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 with President Johnson uh, there and uh, Dr. King looking on. Uh, and so uh, that's part of the uh, rights revolution of the spread of democracies, which I've tracked on this graph here. I'll have a series of these graphs from the book showing that in 1800, in fact, there were no liberal democracies. There was nowhere in the world where every uh, adult could vote. And, uh, and so the, the, the march was, you know, slow but progressive. There was a nice little burst after um, the uh, First World War, and then after the Second World War, and then in the 70s and 80s there, and, uh, and finally got to the point where there's now 118 out of the 196 countries are liberal democracies. Uh, part of that has to do with um, the rights revolutions that unfolded over the centuries, uh, the abolition of slavery, the abolition of torture. In case you're wondering, since I'm from America, we don't torture. We just use enhanced interrogation. Don't confuse the language. <laughs> The rights revolutions of the late uh, 18th century and again in the 1940s and 50s and then more recently, civil rights movement, women's rights, gay rights, same-sex marriage, and animal rights. So the abolition of slavery came about with the invention of rights. That is, it was not, although it was driven in part by religious groups like the Quakers and the Mennonites and uh, religious uh, agita agitators such as William Wilberforce, uh, in fact, they had almost no effect until uh, the rights arguments were made rather than religious arguments. And that happened at the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, end of the 18th century, early 19th century when uh, that really took off. Uh, same thing with judicial uh, torture, the abolition of judicial torture. Again, that happened with the argument that basic rights arguments, arguments that came out of the Enlightenment that were inspired by the age of reason and the scientific revolution that you have to have reasons for your arguments. Uh, you have to have logic behind your arguments, evidence for your arguments. You can't just proclaim uh, that we got this from on high and expect people to accept it when you live in an age of uh, science and reason. Uh, so you'll, um, uh, and so just a few of the, just a reminder of how far we've come because most people when they, they hear me say something like, we're living in the most moral period of our history, they think, are you hallucinating? Haven't you wa been watching the news? You know, ISIS and Syria and just today there was you know, shootings in, in Ferguson of a couple of police uh, and, and so on. It seems like things are bad and getting worse, but if you follow the trend lines instead of the headlines, it's actually quite a different story. Just as a little reminder, this is what, how uh, states used to treat uh, prisoners and, and uh, would-be criminals. This is the rack. Uh, here is um, a few of the ways that they used to torture people to get the truth out of them, so-called truth, breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, sawing in half, it's great fun. Uh, penetrating somebody through both orifices, clawing at them like this. Um, and that's related to the death penalty. Of course, the whole point of torturing somebody was not to kill them, but to make them suffer for as long as possible. One of the points of the rights revolution was that people should not suffer un unduly. Uh, and, and, and so death, of course, is the ultimate form of suffering, and that has been abolished in, in all European states. And, uh, well, we're not quite there yet in America. I'm sorry, we're a little bit behind you all here. Uh, but if you took out Texas, Ohio, and Florida, we're almost there. I'm from California. We haven't executed anybody since 1992. And uh, most prisoners on death row die of old age. Uh, and I'm predicting that the, uh, the, the death penalty will be extinct by 2025. The death penalty is on death row right now. Uh, these are some of the different ways that people have used to execute people in the past. Hunter-gatherers, this is the earliest known depiction of an execution. Uh, ten archers with ten bows and a guy lying on the ground with ten arrows in him. This is how hunter-gatherer groups uh, used ultimately to deal with free riders, cheaters, bullies, nasty people, people that don't play nice by the rules. You just take them out for a hunt and come back without them. Uh, the guillotine was supposed to be more humane, as was the firing squad. Old Sparky, the uh, electric chair that didn't always work so well. And then lethal execution, which is now often botched. Uh, so again, we won't be doing any of this within the next decade or so. 
Uh, in fact, this was all replaced by judicial, uh, rational judicial systems in which, with the accoutrements held here by Lady uh, Justice, you know, the, 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 um, the scales were balanced, the blindfold so she's not biased, and then the sword to enforce the rules. These were driven in part by Enlightenment philosophers such as Jeremy Bentham and Cesarea Beccaria, the latter who wrote a best-selling book in 1764 on essay, uh, an essay on crimes and punishments, still in print. Could only hope my books would stay in print for so long. Uh, in which he first articulated the principle of proportionality, that there ought to be a fixed proportion between crimes and punishments. Before this, it was just torture them all as long as you can and make it as miserable as possible. What great fun could that be? And, and they were the first to say, maybe we should instead take a rational approach to this and see how we can reduce crime because torture doesn't seem to work. The death penalty doesn't seem to work. Uh, the uh, arc of uh, w women's suffrage. Uh, you can track uh, quite dramatically, again, a burst after the First World War, a burst after the Second World War, Switzerland, last of the industrial democracy, Saudi Arabia, hopefully maybe this year, if they do, that'll mean every state in the world uh, allows women to vote. I did, I did note that the Vatican City said, never. <laughs> of course, they don't have any women, so that's part of the problem. And I'm not just talking about the vote. But that's a different issue. Uh, in fact, we're in the midst of another rights revolution right now, gay rights and same-sex marriage. Uh, again, in the United States, this is a huge problem, but big debate. Uh, my wife is from Cologne, Germany. This is her uh, dance partner and his friend, and, and, and gay marriage there is uh, his partner. Gay marriage there is no big deal. It's something that's not even talked about. In America, this will come to an end probably in June when the Supreme Court votes. All the other states then will follow suit by precedent, and then social attitudes will lag behind about five to ten years. And in 2025 or so, we'll be looking back on 2015, like we now look back on interracial marriage debate of the 60s and, uh, 50s and 60s, when, if you can believe it, people used to debate whether it was okay for blacks and whites to get married. Nobody argues that anymore. So my prediction, by the way, is that uh, this, is, this revolution is primarily, um, well, I can show you where it crossed in late, 2012, late 2010, early 2011, when those in favor of it caught up and passed those who were opposed to it. Uh, but if, um, but, but what will happen is, is we, we know who opposes it. It's mostly deeply uh, religious people, fundamentalists, and so forth, and it's mostly led by the non-church, the non-religious, and the most liberal of the religions, Episcopalians, Reformed Jews, uh, Universalists, Unitarians, Humanists, and, and so forth. And, uh, but again, in 10 years, everybody will be in favor of it, and they'll all take credit for it. That gay marriage thing, that was our idea. You know, those Episcopalian, okay, whatever it takes to get us there. Uh, and and that, that's usually how these revolutions uh, happen. By the way, those of you that are in favor of both gay marriage and the legalization of pot, uh, which is another re revolution we're undergoing in the United States right now, I have some good news for you. I found biblical support that you can use. You can quote the Old Testament. Uh, because in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, if a man lies with another man, he must be stoned. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's good. You, un you know what the word stone means. Okay, that, that's a universal word now. <laughs> uh, animal rights, uh, you know, we're almost there in terms of at least the treatment of animals. It began with Jeremy Bentham's original argument. Uh, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So our moral concern should be the survival and flourishing of sentient beings in terms of do they suffer? Can they feel? Are they sentient? Are they self-aware? Do they know when they are feeling pain? And do they know the, the, the cause of the pain and so forth? That, that's the beginning of our moral considerations. This is how we began to expand the moral sphere to include more and more creatures. So I, I define our, my moral starting point as the survival and flourishing of sentient beings so that it's not just us. It's all the cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and so forth. It's all the great apes and, and monkeys. Probably most mammals will get to perhaps this century. Uh, how far is the moral arc bent? I claim that everybody today, conservatives included, are more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s. That's how far we've come. Just think about how people used to talk about Jews and blacks and women and so forth and how we talk about it today. The kind of language used in pop culture films, novels, and so forth, or signs like this. 
Um, and we think about the barbarity of things like Islam and ISIS, extreme Islam, uh, Islamism and ISIS and violent revolutions, but it wasn't that long ago. This is an illuminated um, a Bible from the uh, 12th century in which two Christians are about to behead two Jews for killing Jesus. Okay, this is just an idiotic idea. I mean, the Jews killed Jesus? Jesus was Jewish. And in any case, if he had to die for our sins, you should be thanking his executioners. That's what was supposed to happen. Okay, this whole idea is insane. So the debunking of these kinds of ideas and the expansion of the sphere to include all people as members of our group is, is how we got there. Or the burning of women. You know, ISIS burned a Jordanian pilot alive. Christians used to burn people alive all the time. They were called witches. So I call this the witch theory of causality. If you believe that women cavorting with demons in the middle of the night causes plagues, disasters, crop failures, and bad weather, then you're either insane or you live 500 years ago in medieval, in early modern Europe when everybody believed this. And so what happened is, is that reason in science debunked the witch theory of causality. We replaced the witch theory of causality with scientific theories of causality. Now, it's not the only cause, uh, as we've noted, that ar you know, argumentation is, is the route to go, uh, but sometimes you need to change the law first. Sometimes you need to make it illegal to do these things, but ultimately, I don't not burn witches because it's against the law. I don't, I don't burn witches because it never enters my mind to do it. I don't even think about doing it, and that's the goal of these long arc of the moral arc and expanding the moral sphere is to change people's thinking so they don't even think about doing that. Gay? Whatever, dude. Who cares? Like blacks and whites getting married? Who cares? That's the attitude that we have to get to. So my claim, my central thesis of the moral arc is that ever since the scientific revolution, in which the scientific revolutionaries discovered that the universe is governed by natural laws, and principles that we can understand and apply to change the world. The age of reason and the enlightenment was then the byproduct of that. That is, scholars in other areas taking that idea that perhaps the social world, the economic world, the political world, the moral world is also governed by knowable principles and laws that we can understand and then change to make the world a better place. That's what we've been doing for the last several centuries. Roughly speaking, this is called, or generally speaking, the enlight Enlightenment humanism, but whatever you call it, it's just using science and reason uh, to uh, make the world a better place and change things. And, and that, that has to do with reasoning abstractly. And uh, so what we've discovered, James Flynn discovered over the last couple century, uh, decades is that IQ scores have been going up about three points every 10 years for almost a century. So people are getting smarter, but not on all forms of parts of the IQ test, but just in the abstract reasoning portions. Matrices and similarities in particular, we're getting smarter at this. Matrices are things like this where you have to find the pattern, look at this, find the pattern, and then fill in the one that goes here. It's number five. Or similarities are like, what do, <laughs> what do dogs and rabbits have in common? If you said you use dogs to hunt rabbits, you're thinking concretely. If you answered both are mammals, you're thinking like a scientist in classifying organisms by type, which is an abstraction. So in this sense, expanding the moral sphere to include people who are not like you as members of your group, your honorary moral group, worthy of dignity and, and moral respect and so on, that's an abstract reasoning concept, and we're getting better at that. Uh, the, uh, Flynn himself said that uh, he attributes it to uh, more schooling, more technologies in society, more technical jobs, more access to abstract tasks. This is our economy has shifted from agrarian to industrial to information-based. Uh, this research I have in, in the book about people who read a lot of high literature are better at reading facial expressions, anticipating what people are thinking, uh, you know, just judging somebody's emotional state by their facial expressions. And what novels do, particularly fiction, is that they transport you into somebody else's head, like rotating a, a matrices in space and, and anticipating what it would look like from that perspective is what you do when you read novels. So the idea that the Republic of Letters, education, literature, reading, and so forth, literacy rates, may be one of the drivers of the pushers of the moral arc, not the only one, but expanding the moral sphere but by my retraining all of our brains to think what it would be like to be somebody else. Um, 
And uh, so instead of manipulating plows, cows, and machinery, we're manipulating words, numbers, and symbols. Flynn contrasts the pre-scientific world of his father with the post-scientific world of today through a poignant anecdote about how he and his brother tried to attenuate their father's prejudice through a thought experiment they presented him. What, what if you woke up one morning and discovered your skin had turned black? Would that make you any less of a human being? The senior Flynn shot back, now that's the stupidest thing you've ever said. Who ever heard of a man's skin turning black overnight? So Flynn said of his own father, he, he just wasn't thinking abstractly and hypotheticals, thought experiments, that sort of thing, which is what uh, abstract reasoning helps you to do. So one of the concepts that Enlightenment philosophers came up with to reduce the rates of violence, to increase the moral sphere, and so on, was uh, the Leviathan state. Thomas Hobbes wrote this book, The Leviathan. Uh, it's considered the most influential political track ever written, in which uh, uh, he argued that the state is a way of decreasing incentives for exploitative attack, reduces the need for deterrence and vengeance, replaces self-help justice with criminal justice, and replaces the culture of honor with the culture of law. Uh, and all this is to deal with the fact that we have a dual human nature related to justice and fairness that everybody wants. We have an urgency to help as well as hurt others, to cooperate and be competitive, to be altruistic and greedy. That is, we have better angels and inner demons, as Steven Pinker said in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. So I'm going to show you a short video clip here and then wrap up the talk. It's about a 20-second video clip in which you're going to see these three people are talking. And you'll see this, all of a sudden, um, this man here reaches out and shoves this woman backwards, and she stumbles and starts to fall into the pit. This guy reaches out to grab her, misses, and into the pit she goes. He then steps like he's going to go rescue her, and then all of a sudden, some like urge bubbles up from underneath, and he just turns around and cold cocks this guy. I mean, it's a beauty. Where do you see this thing? He just snaps his head back twice. And then he staggers around for a second like there was something else I was supposed to do. And then he remembers, and then he rescues her, and he takes off. And then he says something to her like, are you okay? And, you know, and the moment she acknowledges this, he then takes off after this guy like he's going to get him. So helping and hurting. So here's the, if you could play the video clip here. And off he goes. <laughs> so now, uh, so in other words, I'm arguing that states uh, are, were the first uh, form of social organization to try to solve the problem of people taking the law into their own hands and have a set of rules and so on. The problem, obviously, is the Leviathan state can turn into an autocracy. Uh, democracies uh, are a solution to this. They're better than autocracies. And this was tested. Uh, so this is a scientific test of this by two political scientists uh, the testing the democratic peace theory by using the correlates of war project and, uh, and the polity project on rating democracies on a one to 10 scale. Basically, in short, they found that as um, both countries are fully democratic, democratic disputes decrease by 50%. When one of them becomes, uh, leans less t toward a democracy and more toward an autocracy, conflicts in increase by 100%. So the formula is that as democracies increase, violence decreases, and you can see the effect here. Uh, these are, this is the increase in autocracies, which collapsed then after the 1970s, the rise of democracies in the 1980s, and interstate conflicts decreased with that. And, and here's a, a beautiful test case, North Korea versus South Korea as a dramatic comparison, so this is kind of a historical science or comparative science. You can see the difference from space between North Korea and South Korea. You can see the difference in their heights several centimeters taller when you have, well, when you have a higher per capita GDP, almost 20,000 per capita in South Korea, barely over 1,000 uh, per capita in North Korea. That's the difference between a democracy and an autocracy. So, in conclusion, basically, I'm saying that we should go from is to ought. If we know that democracies are better than autocracies, then we ought to spread democracies wherever we can. And, uh, and that's because democracies are better able to um, allow the survival and flourishing of sentient beings when they're able to have more freedom and liberty and access and participation in the political process. Uh, that leads to greater flourishing uh, and so forth. Um, and so 
The constitutions of human societies ought to be built on the constitution of human nature. And so, to finish up then with a quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. about this dual human nature we have, each of us is two selves. The great burden of life is to always try to keep that higher self in command. And every time that old lower self acts up and tells us to do wrong, let us allow that higher self to tell us that we were made for the stars, created for the everlasting, and born for eternity. Well, Dr. King was a preacher, and I'm not, I'm an atheist, so I reinterpreted this slightly in the last sentences of my book, that we are in fact made from the stars. Our atoms were forged in the interiors of ancient stars that entered their lives in spectacular paroxysms of supernova explosions that dispersed those atoms into space where they coalesced into new solar systems with planets, life, and sentient beings capable of such sublime knowledge and moral wisdom. We are stardust. We are golden. We are billion-year-old carbon. And so morality is something that carbon atoms can embody given a billion years of evolution, the moral arc. Thank you.